I'm really excited about this paper I'm talking about today. Uh, it's actually uh, a paper that started out as, as sort of a labor of love and a side project. So I was actually working on it off and on for about three years. Um, and in the end, it ended up tying together a lot of ideas. So um, it is going to be presented at CSCW in Vancouver uh, next year. So you're getting a little bit of a preview, and this is actually going to be longer than the actual talk. So I'm going to be talking about a model uh, that I developed with my co-author uh, and student, Drew Payne, called a model of coordinated action. So first, I wanted to talk a little bit about, I'm going to move this chair, about my research program. So I just have two slides on that. And then I'm going to launch into the discussion of, of the model at hand, all right? So my research program is looking at how information systems can be stable for current needs and flexible to accommodate change and innovation, all right? So I'm looking often at anything from the group level to the organization level. I'm looking at change and innovation. And I'm really concerned and interested in designing sustainable organizations, designing sustainable practices, and designing sustainable systems, all right? And these are some threads that tie together a lot of the different research projects I've been working on, mainly in the realm of uh, scientific cyber infrastructures or large-scale information systems that support scientific collaboration. So I have a few projects going on there. My research is almost entirely qualitative research, looking at how groups create and use systems. Uh, the field of computer-supported cooperative work is my sort of bread and butter, it's my intellectual home. I spent a lot of time there. And there's many ways to draw this Venn diagram, but this is one of the ways that I scope it out. Uh, looking at computer-supported cooperative work is happening in this overlap between organizational studies, uh, human-computer interaction, and, and a bit science and technology studies. So that can help you situate uh, some of my work. All right, and my work on scientific cyber infrastructures is definitely fed into the development of, of this model. All right, so back to the, to the work at hand. So in order to understand the relevance and the import of this model, it's important to go back in time a little bit, uh, looking at computer-supported cooperative work and some of the origins of computer-supported cooperative work. So what is computer-supported cooperative work? So the term was coined in 1984. Uh, by Greif and Cashman, and so CSEW as a term has not been around very long. And it's looking at how collaborations and activities can be supported by computer systems. Now historically, groupware, which is software for to support small groups, has been the focus of CSEW. Uh, textbooks in the mid-90s would say uh, that groupware was the practice of the research of CSEW. But CSEW, like any technologically oriented field, has been going through a great deal of change. So computerized technologies and the practices they support continue to grow in diversity, ubiquity, complexity, and scale. We all know that. Many of us in the room are working on that today. And the number of type of research topics similarly have also continued to proliferate. So because of this proliferation and, and the constant change and flux in technology and the scope of what we're studying, it's becoming increasingly urgent to find ways to describe the problem space in which CSCW workers, researchers are working, all right? So even early on in CSCW, I mentioned the term was coined in 1984. As early as 1992, Schmidt and Bannon, who are, uh, you know, recently received a Lifetime Achievement Award for uh, establishing uh, CSCW in Europe, pointed to the need to expand the scope of CSCW. So this actually started happening pretty early in the CSCW. And Schmidt and Bannon said, we need to push for uh, looking at research in settings that are unstable, large, open, and diverse. All right, so already there was, was this sort of uh, conceptual frame about what was the scope of CSCW was happening as early as 92. In CSCW, and again, these are gross generalizations, uh, but European CSCW had a historical focus that included studies of organizations and looking at more heterogeneous organizations. On the other hand, again, a generalization, US CSCW has this historical focus on smaller groups, groupware, and more homogeneous groups. Um, and so the, 
because of the size of the CSCW community versus the European community, uh, some of the gravitas towards the theoretical development also tended towards these smaller groups. So you may ask, what is a model of CSEW? So models of CSEW in the context of this talk and the paper, forthcoming paper, refer to conceptual models that posit the elements that compose computer-supported cooperative work, so the elements that compose CSEW. The models thus far of CSEW, and I'm going to talk about some in a minute, have largely been descriptive. And to date, our model is also descriptive, but hopefully we'll push it beyond that a little bit. Um, and so for this talk, when I talk about models of CSEW, I'm talking about models that are posited as being comprehensive of CSEW. Because there are actually a lot of models that take parts of CSEW, and some of them are mentioned in the paper, but this one's comprehensive. All right, so how many of you are familiar with Johansson's matrix? Yeah, all right, so a number of people. And it, it's manifested a little bit differently than sometimes. But this is actually the actual terminology that was used in the original 1998 text of Johansson's matrix, where he talks about the, um, the two dimensions of asynchronicity and, and location. So are people co-located or are they distributed? Are they synchronous or asynchronous? Uh, so you don't need to focus too much on the details there, but I wanted to put that up. Um, because historically, this is a very important table. All right, so for those of you who have raised your hands about knowing the matrix, how many of you are familiar with this table? All right, that's the usual uh, response. So if you go back and look at the original text, this matrix and this table are posited as equally important. But if you look at the HCI textbooks today, they only mention this matrix. So what's interesting about that is that, and again, you don't have to get too much into the details, I just wanted to show you some primary material, um, is that Johansson recognizes the need to also study large groups. The original matrix, you'll notice it actually specifically calls out meetings, all right? That meetings are very important to CSEW, very important to groupware, but Johansson actually in his original work said we need to talk about large groups as well. But this, there's no mention of this in our HCI textbooks, only of the matrix. All right. So here's another model uh, from 1994 by Jonathan Gruden, where if you look at it, you'll see uh, organizations, projects, small groups, and individuals. Now in the actual text, he says CSEW draws upon and ventures into these other circles, but he says CSEW research, its home is in small groups. All right. So I'll come back to that in a second. So Johansson's taxonomy is considered a taxonomy of tools. But if you think about it, it's also implicitly a framework describing work itself. And what are the salient, most important aspects of collaborative work? Now, it's specious to suggest that many CSEW researchers still consider the matrix to be representative of CSEW research today. But it's also true that it's still considered to be uh, the traditional way uh, to decompose CSEW, and some of the textbooks actually use those words. Um, so this model is sort of stepping into this, this moment of time where CSEW is facing this existential crisis, you know? I'm CSEW, why am I CSEW, you know? And, and so a new conceptual model is needed that can help us to understand CSEW as a comprehensive and, and coherent design field. And you know, I talk about this in the paper that a lot of the pressures in American CSEW today is because of some of the research that we're already doing, looking at uh, large-scale information infrastructures and the development of them. These are very complex organizational systems with a lot of different stakeholders. But also, and I know a lot of you in this room are studying crowdsourcing, mass participation, that that's also putting a lot of pressure in CSEW to look at larger scale collaborations. Why? Because a lot of the things that people are doing, for example, through Twitter, are essentially organizational formation. You know, so we start looking at Twitter, which is a very simple, uh, in, uh, you know, technology. But then we find that these very complex organizational forms are being created, partly leveraging that. 
So this question has arisen, what is the phenomenon of steady and computer-supported cooperative work? If Johansson's matrix is outdated, if group wear is not comprehensive anymore, what is it that we're studying? So I'm going to go into, you know, a sort of little theoretical background here, but that ties into the everyday practice of CSEW, that the work that's happening today, especially with all that pressure and crowdsourcing and information infrastructures, is pushing the borders of CSEW. So let's talk a little bit about the theoretical concept of articulation work. So articulation work is making sure the various resources needed to accomplish something are in place and functioning when needed in a local situation. The resources are in place and functioning when needed in a local situation. And this work was, uh, was uh, this concept was posited by Anselm Strauss, a sociologist, and he talks about these spectra uh, of collaborative work projects falling on a continuum from simple to complex. And you can think of some of your own collaborations that you're involved in or that you're studying, thinking about are they simple or are they complex? So articulation work is implicitly reliant upon this notion of the common field of work. All right, so what is the common field of work? So the common field of work is the site of action for coordinative work. It's constituted by the interdependence and multiple actors who in their individual activities in changing the state of their individual field of work also change the state of the field of work of others and who thus interact through changing the state of a common field of work. All right, so this seems pretty complicated and pretty, pretty hard to understand, but um, I have an example that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But interaction through a common field of work is considered a fundamental distinction of cooperative work. All right. So the example I, I give in the paper is this notion of a, a food bank, right? So the common field of work is that there's somebody who's hungry um, who needs food, and we want to give them food. So a person gets into their car, they load up some canned goods in their car, and they drive it to a food drive at a shopping mall, and they leave it in the shopping mall. But the interesting thing is that even though they've undertaken this work, they haven't actually changed the common field of work, which is the person who needs canned goods in their cupboard to cook that night. All right, so is the common field of work actually at the food bank that's going to receive the shopping mall, or is it uh, something else? Some people would argue, well, actually, in this case, then, the common field of work is the shopping mall where they're collecting the food. But they haven't actually changed the status of the hungry person, all right? So there's a degree of separation. And not too many people in the field of CSEW have really, you know, no, focused on these theoretical perspectives. Uh, there's some arguments that, you know, okay, CSEW doesn't create its own theory. I'm trying to help change that. Uh, there have been some folks flittering around the, the edges of CSEW who have been working on this. Dr. Elihu Gerson, right there, is one of them. And um, we're very lucky to have someone who's a product of the Chicago School of Sociology in our community. Um, but so I'm taking a slightly different spin on things, that there may be multiple overlapping common fields of work, that people may be working in a concerted and coordinated fashion and have compatible but slightly different goals. And you can imagine this in any large system development you know, situation. People are belonging to different departments. People who are at different stages of their careers may have slightly different goals, yet they all manage to work together in an organization. So the spectra of Strauss's, where he talks about routine to non-routine and simple to complex, is helpful, but it doesn't quite go far enough because there are many ways in which a collaboration can be routine or non-routine or simple to complex. And there's many aspects to many different kinds of collaborative work. All right, so this model is an attempt to, to kind of push some of these ideas a little further. So why? It, why do we call it a model of coordinated action rather than of cooperative work? Because the field is computer-supported cooperative work. Well, it has to do with that notion of the common field of work and articulation work. Coordinated action frees us from having to decide on only one common field of work and only one clear-cut goal, okay? It's actually holding us back from the phenomena that researchers are already studying. 
And it's removing this bias towards smaller, tightly knit cooperative uh, configurations and allows rooms to study large, more loosely knit coordinated actions. This doesn't mean we stop studying small groups, because small groups are still important, but that we make room to study these larger collaborations and also the interaction, very importantly, between the small groups and the larger groups. So we choose the word action to emphasize the importance of goal directedness, implied by the word, word work, while also opening up space to talk about things that we might not typically think of as work, like serious leisure or relationship work. So in this model of coordinated action, we posit seven dimensions. The first dimension should be quite familiar to you by now, because they're the same dimensions that we had in Johansson's matrix. You're referred to as synchronicity and physical distribution, and those terms are uh, used by some other takes on Johansson's matrix as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of these dimensions one at a time, but I want to just show you that these are continuums. It's not either or, one or the other, but there's a continuum of being more or less any of these seven dimensions. So I'm going to take them one at a time. So the first dimension is synchronicity, which we discussed a little bit. This continuum of coordinated action ranging from being conducted synchronously or at the same time to asynchronously or different times. I'm not going to talk about that much because it's been talked about a lot. Again, same thing with dimension two. It's also been talked about a lot. Physical distribution, the continuum which covers concerns whether coordinated actions are taking place in the same geographic regions or different ones. All right. So the interesting thing about scale is we all think about scale, and scale is referred to in the papers, but obliquely. But we know from coordination theory that scale matters, because as soon as you go beyond a very small number of collaborators, they need to do a lot of articulation work. That is, there's a lot of activity that needs to be done just to organize people in order to get anything done. All right, so scale does matter. Dimension four is number of communities of practice. So communities of practice is a framework itself. It's actually a very uh, developed theory uh, by work on by um, Wenger and Lav. But we're only taking one aspect of this. We're just talking about number of communities of practice. And this is focus specifically on the notion of different cultural communities or a certain type of intellectual diversity. So the simplest way to think about that is people from different disciplines coming together trying to collaborate. You know, if you have a designer, and you have a software engineer, and you have an educator, and you have a historian, they're going to come with different world views, different values, different ways of doing things. And so we're trying to get here at a certain type of cultural diversity when we talk about number of communities of practice. Now in the paper we talk about it being salient whether these communities of practice are represented. So for example, you could have a design team of seven people from seven different domains, and we would consider that to have seven communities of practice. Or you could have seven teams, a team of all software engineers, a team of all designers, for example, a team of all architects, and maybe that would be three. So it's talking about this cultural gap that needs to be bridged in order to come up with common nomenclatures, common, way, common ways of working, even sometimes articulating what the common goal is. All right, so dimension five is nascence. So this is unestablished versus established coordinations. And I want to really underline that it's not merely a simple synonym for newness. Rather, it applies a sort of coming into being, a special kind of, if you will, instability rife with future potentialities. It's like a little bit of poetry in there for you. All right. So we might see nascence you know, in a reformed and rebooted coordination. So it's not just a matter of, we just started working together, but it's, but it's also like the ground is shifting under us and we're not sure what's happening. So for example, economic pressures or somebody uh, quitting could cause instability, causing people have to reform um, how established and on the ground this coordination feels. All right. So another one is planned permanence, or the intended permanence of a coordinated action. So I want to 
emphasize why we call it planned permanence. We call it planned because we can't really know how permanent something is going to be. Someone could set up a collaboration saying, yeah, well, this is designed to last for five years, you know, 10 years. It's going to be awesome, but we don't really know. If the funding gets pulled in year three, then, you know, it's not going to be permanent. So we can only can talk about planned permanence. But think about why it matters. All right. It matters because, and uh, in the paper I give an example, is a family who's going to the forest and they're setting up camp. They're going to stay there for, you know, five days. Versus family that's moving to the forest and they're planning on, on staying there for 10 years. What kinds of preparations would you take place if you're taking your family to the woods for five days versus if you're taking your family to the woods for 10 years or more? You're going to put a lot of more effort into planning, all kinds of articulation work, accumulating resources. It becomes a very different type of collaboration than it's quick and dirty, well, let's get a campsite, let's get a tent, we'll get dirty, we'll roll around in the mud, it'll be awesome. All right. So dimension seven is turnover. And this is the stability of the participant makeup of a given collaboration, particularly the rapidity with which participants enter and leave, okay? So I know some of you who are looking at crowdsourcing are looking at collaborations where there's very rapid turnover. There's very little stability. So some people ask me, why do you have a separate one for turnover and nascence? And I want to say that's because there are situations where something could have a lot of turnover but not be very nascent uh, or the other way around. It's true they often come together and these dimensions are not meant to be mutually exclusive, right? But they can vary together, uh, but also differ. All right. Okay, so these are the, the seven dimensions of the model of coordinated action, all right? So what are some of the implications of this? That we've t gone from Johansson's two dimensions into these seven dimensions. You know, why? What's the, the, the relevance of this entire model? Well, one is this notion of coordinated action, that coordinated action can still be conceived of as people working together towards a shared goal. You know? Because I know in my early work, when I was first getting started in this study of scientific collaborations, looking at these very large, gooey collaborations with different teams, and, and, uh, and it was very, you know, open-ended. And some of the reviewers would say, but how is this CSCW? You know, this is, this, is, this is a mess, or this is more, you know, I don't know what this is. This isn't <laughs> collaboration. Um, but we're seeing a lot of that happen in, in, our, in, in our, the fun on we're looking at, right? And to acknowledge that shared goals can be only very loosely shared sometimes. They can be very diffuse and ill-defined. And also to see that working, working together can be people working rather separately, separately on different systems that still need to operate with a larger, more sprawling infrastructure, okay? That many organizations and computing systems are partially but not completely interoperable. All right, but we've come a long way from this sense of people working together. If it's a functioning, good collaboration, should all have a very good sense of what's going on with whom and how. Well, a lot of the research we've done and we've seen now say that people often don't have a very good idea of who's doing what with how, with whom and how, but they still manage to get the job done. You know, so there's element of how much shared understanding do you need in order for it to be good enough for the work at hand. All right. And that often these overlapping and non-congruent interests and priorities are okay. So one of the other things, the implications for this model is to, to shine the light on this notion of emergence, okay? And in the, the paper, if you, you know, care to seek it out later, I have a whole section that's just a fire hose of people in CSCW talking about emergence essentially for the last 10 or 11 years, but it never quite getting traction, you know? So I put together the whole fire hose for you and you can, you can ingest it. So that coordinated actions that exhibit social emergence are becoming even more ubiquitous in our research, all right? And 
that it's increasingly relevant to everyday life given the extended reach of social media and for information technologies, okay? And this notion of social emergence, uh, there's a sociologist, um, R. Keith Sawyer, who has a whole book on it, which is very dense, but fun. Um, and he talks about how larger systems, and he's not the only one, but I liked his, his take on it, but he talks about how larger systems influence smaller systems and smaller systems interact with larger systems and how smaller interactions impact uh, smaller collaborations. And what we're doing as people in human computer interaction is inserting ourselves, inserting our technologies into different parts of this, this whole system of practices and understandings trickling up and trickling down in these collaborations, okay? So if we're creating a very small application for a small group of people, that can have ripple effects for the larger collaboration, the larger organization. Similarly, if you're looking at people at a large infrastructure where it's very top down, that sometimes there'll be, uh, you know, very direct impacts on the collaboration from the top down that also influence the type of technology that's desired, accepted, et cetera. All right. And so that a lot of times what we're doing are, we're not designing a solution, but we're actually designing an intervention into a much bigger problem or a much bigger design space, okay? So one of the things that I'm pushing for with this model is for us to be a little more reflective about what are we trying to do when we're trying to insert these technologies into these social systems, into these social milieu. If we just, you know, with a butterfly flapping its wings, if we put the butterfly right here, what are the ripple effects, okay? So having these emergent qualities is a fundamental reality of many of these contemporary coordinated actions. The challenge of designing to support emergence becomes increasingly as important as we consider more types of coordinated action that are complex or more extreme on any of those seven dimensions that we talked about. Whether it's like extremely high turnover or it's a very small scale, et cetera, any of the extremes. So how can we make sense of the types of coordinated action making a new model uh, such as MOCA necessary? And I'm not positing this as the one model that will rule them all, but I'm rather trying to get a conversation started, saying, can't we consider some of these things, all right? What does it mean to do collaborative work, cooperative work? Because we're modeling sociality, whether we acknowledge it or not, every time we design a collaborative system. So let's just put that up into the light for inspection. So the notion of emergence is not new to CSEW, but it's kind of been just flittering around on the edges. And so I'm just trying to shine, shine a light on it and, and to consider this notion of emergent coordinated action as one way of describing some of these ways of working. All right. So this touches on many years of empirical research. You know, the interesting thing is, I didn't think this paper would be accepted because I didn't collect any new data for this study. Um, so I was thrilled when, when, when it was accepted. This is after a couple of rejections. <laughs> but it did make the paper better. Um, but it touches on many, many years of empirical research. And it's still an early step in a larger pro project to contribute to theory that originates from the CSCW community that is for the CSCW community, all right? And, and we propose here a particularly, particular kind of theoretical, theoretically driven empirical program, all right? So we want to promote this development of other conceptual frameworks that put all manner of research and technologies that support coordinated action in conversation with each other, all right? So what, if we continue to work and develop on this, develop this model, which is our goal, what are some of the practical implications of this, right, in the short or the medium term, all right? So one of the, the goals would be to be able to have a way of systematically studying change within one coordinated action over time. So we can see, you know, okay, at the beginning of this project, the collaboration looked like this on these seven dimensions. In the middle, it looked like this on the seven dimensions. At the end, it looked like this on the seven dimensions. And then what were the implications then for the different types of technology that people used, that they rejected, that they adopted, 
that there's to have a way of systematically teasing apart these as socio-technical um, as socio-technical configurations. All right, but also differences and similarities within particular domains. So what kind of differences can we see within certain health collaborations? But also differences and similarities within particular types of activity. So if we look at all the studies of mass participation or infrastructure development, what, are the, what kinds of diversity do we see there? But also interesting across, you know, differences across domains and spheres of activity. We've gotten to the point of maturity in CSEW where it's like all the Wikipedia scholars hang out with each other and they know their research and all the scientific infrastructure collab, you know, folks get together and they know each other's research. We're getting to a point where we're, we're going to, we have already started missing opportunities across these disciplinary silos. But consider that a small nascent collaboration in a science lab might have more in common with a small uh, nascent collaboration on Twitter than very established collaborations on, uh, in similar realms. All right. So it's a way of having a dialogue across methodological and disciplinary divides. And so one of the, the things that could be interesting is the development of a way to index different coordinated actions at the time of data collection. You know, for, so for example, we can lower the overhead that it takes in order to study similar types of research that are studying similar types of problems and similar types of collaborations. If at the time of data collection, people go like, okay, you know, this is the snapshot of the seven types of dimensions, then you can search on it later, uh, and then we all get more traction with the same amount of research. And then perhaps the identification of the equivalent of personas. We currently in ACI, we have a lot of personas for, we develop personas for individuals. Well, what if we can develop personas for different types of collaborations based on these seven dimensions and say, okay, these types of collaborations with high turnover, high nascence, large scale, they tend to need this type of technological intervention at this type of their development. All right, we try to find Themes, patterns help us leverage what we're doing. Okay. All right, so what are some next steps? You know, and it's interesting because anytime you tr start to take on theoretical work like this, it's a very, very, very slow moving shift. You know, it takes a long time to, to develop them, it takes a long time to test them, it takes a long time to evaluate them, it takes a long time to build them. But what are some of our next steps for this model? Well, one is to do a post hoc retro, retrospective content analysis of CSCW publications over time, to document changes in CSCW in terms of what types of collaborations that people have been studying. We expect that scale will be something that has changed quite a bit over time, that there's more diversity in scale now than there once was. And also further document and describe the seven dimensions. I should mention in the paper itself, we describe the dimensions and give examples more than I had time to hear. Um, but we can further articulate and elaborate on those. But also to develop ordinal measures for the seven dimensions, because that's when we really uh, get some traction. In the paper itself, we go through two examples. One, at looking at scientific cyber infrastructure development. Other, at crowdsourcing mass participation work. Uh, we use some of the work of Star and Palin for that. Or sorry, Starbird and Palin for that. Um, and in those examples, we kind of just crudely measure into, you know, uh, low, medium, high for those different dimensions to give you an example of the kind of traction and the kind of narratives that you can talk about there. Over the longer term, we want to fur further develop these connections between theories of social emergence as they pertain to technical design interventions. So I mentioned before, you know, you want to see what the ripple effects if you insert the, the technical butterfly at, you know, small group level or organizational level. Um, what are some of the ripple effects? Um, but maybe we can look more at that and take more seriously CSEW as a socio-technical uh, design field. And also conduct some large-scale meta-research uh, on collaborative research. So if you're familiar with the work of Gary and Judy Olson's work, they attempted to do this a few years ago on scientific collabor collaboratories, of trying to get different dimensions on, um, to describe different types of just scientific collaboratories. But it was difficult because at that time we didn't have some of the research that we have now to sketch out the different dimensions. And so I think we're getting, getting closer to that. 
And, uh, and I've been talking with Judy Olson about uh, expanding some of that scientific uh, collaboratory work uh, based on newer stuff like this model. So this model of coordinated action is a step into the continued exploration of CSCW as a design field. And you know, one of the things I really want to iterate is sometimes this work makes people feel uncomfortable because people are like, this is sociology, this is social science, this is not CSCW. And I say bullshit to that <laughs> because I've been in this realm of CSCW since my first year as a doctoral student. You know, my PhD advisor was a computer scientist, my postdoc advisor was a computer scientist. And and there is space in CSEW for doing our own original theoretical work. That does not mean everybody needs to be a theorist, right? That there's room for this kind of work and that we can use this kind of work to inform our technological interventions. You know, I've had numbers of points in my career where I thought, well, you know, it'd be really nice to be closer to, to product development. But the thing is, I'm really good at this, and there are a lot of people who are really good at product development, more so than I am. So I, I'm still, I'm still uh, mining this vein. All right. So we want this better understanding of what it means to design for socio-technical systems that can be socially and technically complex and subject to frequent changes. All right. So designed to support coordinated action, we need to know more about what coordinated action is. What are we actually designing for, right? It's not a simple answer because collaboration is not simple. The technologies we're developing are not simple, all right? And we need to have better ways to talk about these variations. And you know, maybe with people who are doing work like I'm doing, we can get more lift and we could get farther with the work that we are doing. You know, technically, <laughs> not just socially, but both. So I like this quote from Logren and Stolterman, where they say, design theory is knowledge focused on creating new conditions for design, different patterns of thinking and acting, new design examples, and a general understanding of the conditions for creative and innovative work. All right. So I think we definitely have room in our field, in HCI generally, CSCW more specifically, to have more design theory. So I've mentioned this before, but I want to say it again, that HCI researchers are already pushing into the frontiers of accepting and exploring new ways of coordinated action. And our theory and conceptual frameworks should follow suit. All right, thanks. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Are there any existing tools or products that you like that think that, that you think incorporate the dimensions of the MOCA framework? Oh. Well, I mean, so the MOCA framework is designed to be kind of like GPS coordinates, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a roadmap or a map. So every system, every collaboration and every collaborative system should fall on the MOCA somewhere. So I guess, you know, I'm kind of doing an end run around your questions. <laughs> you know, any system can be, be uh, Are there any that you like in particular just for personal reasons or, you know, any that you think are great? Um, yeah, I guess the, the short answer is no, because, you know, it's like, <laughs> uh, you know, there are tools I like and applications I like, but, you know, you know, I like Twitter, I like Facebook, but what's important about those is how they work in context. And so it's like, it's not the same as liking the, the system, you know, right, right, yeah, Gilbert? Oh, uh, maybe a way of reframing that, is there, is there any, that, Maybe just talk about technical systems in the right way to frame it. Mm -hmm. Any socio-technical systems that you find particularly illustrative with the dimensions? Well, I mean, again, I can't. I, I can't answer the question because the dimensions are just a map. It's sort of like saying what GPS coordinate is your favorite, and it's sort of like, well, then it's just what place is my favorite, or maybe that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Illustrate the utility of the dimensions, or. 
or get a flight pattern. Right, right. Um, well, so I would refer you to the, the examples in the paper. And actually, the preprint is available online as of two days ago. So you can do that, where we actually look at, for example, uh, Humanity Road, which is a collaboration uh, for disaster relief that Pila and Starbird write about. And they talk about these very interesting ways that people are using Twitter, along with Skype and some other collaborations, um, to illustrate you know, how this very nascent collaboration evolved. And then we have another example looking at scientific cyber infrastructure. So, and it's not even that those are particularly good examples, but they are examples showing the, how you can kick the tires and use a model for understanding organizational uh, status as well as change. Yeah. Oh, three hands at once. I'll go from left to right. Uh, Chimai, yeah. Uh, so one nice property of the Hansen framework is that it's so parsimonious. Right? There's two dimensions, there's two values on those two dimensions. Yeah. yeah. It's easy to teach. Yes. Uh, and I, I'd like to know, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on teaching people this new framework? Because mm -hmm. I certainly many more dimensions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I have lost sleep over the relative inelegance of having these seven dimensions versus the two dimensions of Johansson's matrix. And I actually probably spent 10 months trying to find a way to simplify it to make it more, more parsimonious. And I just couldn't. Uh, I even like met with math. I talked with some mathematicians. It's like, how would you? <laughs> and they're like, oh, you should just have three different tables. It's like, oh, okay, I'm just back where I started. So that's how I ended up with the seven lines. So, um, so yeah, I, I I have that same discomfort that you do, and wishing that it was simpler. But uh, and maybe you know, as we develop the framework, we'll find a. Uh, you know, a cleaner way to describe it. But as of now, it's this is collaboration. It's messy. It's complex, and I couldn't distill it any further than this. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so my question is mostly about um, what, what kind of systems that we've been studying in CSCW. Mm -hmm. and these might say on it is mostly any system that has multiple users. Mm -hmm. So um, I was wondering how you feel about systems like Facebook and setting how people use them and how that falls into your description of coordinating work. Yeah, right. So. What's, sorry? Coordinated action. Oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, in the paper at the end, I say, well, I don't actually object. You know, I don't, I'm not upset if people use the words cooperation or collaboration. It was just for, for technical and precise terminology. I wanted to use coordinated action, but I don't, you know, object because it's a historical term. But your, your question was, uh, sorry, your question was again. Could you repeat it? Um, I was wondering how you feel about um, people studying systems like Facebook oh. and if it really falls into that. Right. Right. Yeah, so this is interesting. So, you know, as computer scientists, you're all asking questions about specific technologies. And, and to take a step back, it's like I look at, I really truly see the world in terms of socio technical collaborations. So I look at the social part and the technical part, and I see the world as that, as that very interwoven. Like you can't extricate it. So Facebook is just one part of, one part of a larger set of practices and concerns, right? So it's a matter of, are you using Facebook to organize parties? Or are you using uh, Facebook to do the relationship work of keeping up with your high school friends? Are you using uh, Facebook to, uh, to create documents? I've seen people do that as well. So what we're studying when we're studying the collaborations is, you know, again, I mentioned that notion of goal directedness. So what is the goal that some group of people are using that technology for? OK. So then you can't take Facebook out of the collaboration of the goal or the group of people. You know? So that is, that is the phenomenon of study, is this close intertwining of particular purpose, the group, and then the technology. So then you know, Facebook for 10 people to uh, create a party is very different from the collaboration, which is Facebook for a thousand people to, uh, you know, uh, create an open source, you know, tool or something like that. Yeah. All right. Yes, in the back. Like, reminds me of like personality tests, right? So it's like there's a bunch of dimensions, and then and then it puts you in some point, like yeah, you're an ENTJ. But I think like, the actual value of personality tests are like like what you actually infer from that, right? So it's like X percentage of the population are ENTJs, they work well with this kind of, of uh, other types of, of, uh, of people, and um, 
like they're, they're end up that these types of tasks. I'm like um, I'm not sure if you thought of like something analogous for your model. Um, yeah, I mean, it was hard not to, in a way, you know, because it's like, uh, you know, I've taken the Myers-Briggs multiple times and, and, you know, mapped the changes over time, and, you know, the most, and, you know, there's a lot of research sort of debunking Myers-Briggs as well, and as there would be for any kind of model uh, like that. Uh, but it is very useful for having those conversations about, you know, what does it mean to be this on the spectrum, right? And so you can imagine having those similar types of conversations that, you know, oh, I might have with my friends because, you know, I used to be INTP and now I'm INTJ, well, isn't that cool? Or isn't that weird, you know? Um, but, but yeah, the expectation is that, you know, it, it suffers from both the, the pros and minuses of trying to map dimensions of anything. You know, you have that question of how valid is it anyway, right? And, you know, if you're doing your work right, that's probably going to be changing over time because you're discovering new things over time. But it is, it is a way to get some kind of traction. Uh, oh, wait, let's see. Yeah, okay. yeah, I was going to say that it seems like the, uh, the, the dimensions are more useful to be aware of what it means to be on either side of it as opposed to, you know, where you fall into it. And especially if you were to, like, map out some sort of employee or some sort of projects, I guess, position on each of those coordinates. And if you had to pick one side over the other, you've got two to the seven possibilities. But, I don't know, in my experience as being an intern at you know, places that are really heavily corporate. Mm -hmm. I feel like my best managers and best mentors were aware of, you know, a few of those different dimensions, and I could actually see how they actually planned for me to do a certain amount of work. Right. And were very aware that, you know, I would be there only for three months. This is who I'd have to hand off my work to. And, you know, how much of this stuff is going to be repetitive work and who you need to talk to to be able to, you know, take on new tasks. So yeah. I feel like the dimensions are... <coughs> really useful to be aware of, and I could totally see managers taking a course on this. Right, right, right. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's really the, the immediate hope, is that we put some of these ideas on, you know, into people's heads so that people actually, it's actually, in the short term, just a tool for people to have these kinds of conversations, you know, because one of the reasons is, you know, everybody knows that collaboration is hard. You know, everyone who's tried to collaborate is hard, knows it's hard, and everyone who's, who, who has studied it knows that it's hard. But the thing is, we don't know why it's hard. We don't know how to break it down its, into its constituent parts. You know, some of the research I've done recently is looking at epidemiology research, as the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. You know, some of the brightest minds in cancer research, and we're interviewing them, and we tell them about our work, looking at collaboration. And these folks who are, you know, working on cancer say, "Oh, we didn't think that was a problem that you could you could study and and, and solve, or you know, even a study you could tackle." You know, that people think that collaboration is just some sort of magic, untractable thing. And so what we're trying to do is break it down into constituent parts. You know, maybe these aren't the right constituent parts, but it's a start, right? So that people can have these dialogues. My hope is that we actually do get some ordinal values on that so we get more subtlety uh, and we can have more nuance in those discussions. Like, yeah, it is helpful to know, you know, one extreme versus the other extreme. That's already a great starting point for a discussion. But if we can get, you know, even a low, medium, high, or maybe even get five values, my goodness, you know, what could we possibly, you know, end up saying then? You know, right? Yeah, Jinlai. So uh, I think this relates to the, uh, the last two questions as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a space, but in addition to a space, there's an implicit goodness function in some sense, right? So you have a space, but not all of that space is equally good. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder what it would take to move from this descriptive model to a sort of predictive model where you can say, look, if you want to have a system of high nascency and high turnover, yeah. you just can't support interactions with n people at a time. You have to go to n by 10. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what would get us from descriptive to this? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first step is getting some ordinal values of some kind, even if it's low, medium, high, or whatever. But that's only the starting point, right? So it's like, OK. Once we have low, medium, high, we don't only have dimensions, but we have, actually have coordinates. You know, I'm going to use a metaphor again of GPS coordinates. But that's only the beginning of the work, right? The interesting thing is what happens when you say, let's go and study everybody who's at this coordinate, you know, who's like at these, uh, you know, where all the seven things, they are all at, you know, point three on the, se on the seven dimensions. Let's study everybody who's doing that, and let's look at, 
You know, how happy are they with their collaborations? Or how many, you know, patents or products or do they put out? Uh, how much turnover, you know, where you can actually start to look at best practices for those specific types. You know, and that's one of the reasons we have to have so many dimensions is that there are so many different types of collaborative ways of working that that's the only way to capture the, the diversity. But once we can say like, okay, you know, we have, you know, I was talking about the idea of personas before. It's like, we can even go farther than personas and do empirical research for particular types of collaborations and say, for that type of collaboration is falling at these places on the seven dimensions, what are they doing that's working? You know, what are they doing that they're happy about? There may not even be one right answer, but we can at least start having that dialogue of figuring out what is the goodness and then maybe even getting into some predictive uh, modeling. Yeah. And again, this is like a very long term project, not a short term project. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Here. Mm -hmm. question yes. explicitly or implicitly or whether you rule it out. So mm -hmm. um, the characteristic of teams that we're all familiar with is, is the life cycle of a collaboration. Yeah. And um, there are space phases that are that are, are well known and just as consistent across if, if, do you feel that your dimensions take that into account that there's 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 some that have a pattern of, of a certain life cycle phases? Um, but others may be different, even though they, I think these attributes might be the same right. if the life cycle is a little different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So are you talking about the, the entire span of the overall life cycle, or are you talking about something different? There might be collaborations that are more pulsing and mm -hmm. consistent. There's a commonality, but just consistent. Yeah. Uh, but new, new people come in, or new tools come in periodically. Right. Well, there might be some characteristics with uh, uh, phasing, which is just random, yeah. uh, or it might be the classic uh, kind of a normal, a normal curve of a startup phase with right. with, uh, with with storming amongst yeah. the team, and, Absolutely. and they get into a groove, and then they, they shut down. Yeah, yeah. So that, those sort of those sort of life cycles yeah, seem yeah. to be. Of a certain set of types, I'm sure there's a taxonomy somewhere. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you feel that, that takes into account, or do you do do you rule that out? I've, both and neither. So, so the life cycle question, the temporal aspect, is very important. Uh, but I didn't feel prepared to put that in the model because I didn't have enough data. My data, I mean existing CSCW research that looks at those those temporalities. But I do think they're very important. So some. Well, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think we get at it obliquely already by the notions of turnover, nascence, you know. And so one of the opportunities here is once we have these is that we can actually try to look at maybe some of those temporal aspects. Because some of the, the collaborations may evolve much more quickly than others. We would expect in a startup that those ticks over would happen much faster than in a, you know, a larger organization. Um, yeah. Questions, comments, uh, Gilbert. So I'm um, a little bit curious. This may be pushing a little bit back towards you know the the computer science end. Of, sure. Well, we're building this system, right? Yeah. And it it strikes me that uh, the model that you have here is talking about actions mm -hmm. or events or collaborations. Right. And often when we're building, if we're building a system like say. Facebook or another sort of uh, social platform. Yeah, they would call them platforms, mm -hmm. and we think of them in terms of perhaps architecture or spaces or um, you know city planning or like planning a park. Mm -hmm. It's hard to anticipate what it's going to be used for, and it's going to be used for a lot of different collaborations, yeah. a lot of different actions. <coughs> mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you've thought much about how that slightly different uh, category of, of, of thing, right? right. The, these platforms which are different than the actions yeah. which yeah. involve them. Right, right, right. Well, I mean, I think it's a question, so even if you're designing a platform, it's sort of a platform for what, right? And then if you're going to design a platform, do you, you, you usually still want to think about specific instances. I think it's just natural as a software developer that, you know, you're going to think about, oh, but what if people want to do this, right? Or what if people want to do that? Or, or you know, and, and so 
you can have that discussion, you know, and I, I guess probably the most cognizant or similar thing in my own work is people designing these scientific cyber infrastructures. They're supposed to be infrastructures, you know, it's supposed to be plug and play. But inevitably, they have alpha users, you know, who are just sort of like, okay, you know, this is supposed to be an infrastructure for all uh, people who study environmental genomics, but in actuality, we still have to design it with somebody in mind, and we can't design it for everybody because we don't have time, money, budget to do this extensive uh, study of everyone studying genomics. So they usually start out with some alpha testers, right? Domain scientists are going to go like, well, this is what I do, this is what I need, and they have a few of those, and they design it in. I can see that it being similar in the platform development, right? where you think like, okay, we want everyone to use it for all kinds of things, including things we haven't thought about, but we still need a starting point to think about. So, you know, maybe in terms of using this model, we can think about, you know, some help us to pick who those alpha users are going to be, right? Yeah. Maybe uh, there's also some benefit in knowing which things transfer, where movement can happen in these dimensions. Right. You know, so something developed for this coordinate, to, to what other coordinates does that tend to generalize effectively or not? Right, right, right. So if it, it's well for, it works well for these levels of, you know, nascents, maybe it's okay for that level of turnover or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard. It's At this point, it's impossible to yeah, yeah, yeah. speculate or maybe probably not even useful, but it's something to, fun to thought exercise. Yeah, right. Uh, David? Is there a bit room in your model for technology itself? So. Uh, uh, I was thinking about Gilbert's question about yeah. the platforms, but what about things like are you using mobile technology versus non mobile technology? Mm -hmm. Or if you're a, a high tech, super rich collaborator with yep. not so rich, you know, uh, like so, so the actual technologies themselves, yep. do you think that would practically play a role? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is the this is the, the the substrate. I mean, the whole reason I'm doing this in CSEW is because I'm interested in in technology design. Uh, otherwise, I would take my toys and go do it in sociology, but I, I I don't because I'm interested in technology design. And you know, part of the difficulty that folks have been having is that for more and more things that we're looking at, especially in CSEW, we're very interested in particular practices, communities, cultures that we're seeing that these aggregations of different types of tools, software and hardware, are necessary for getting work done. So it's not just I use this one application, but I use like a series of applications and a couple scripts and a few different pieces of hardware, right? And so we were losing that traction by trying to trying to focus it around one technology, right? And so what I'm hoping is that when we get this model to a further, uh, further developed and more mature state, then we can start mapping actually aggregations and clusters of different types of technologies that we see in these different types of, of things. And it, it's probably going to be domain specific, right? But this is just one layer, you know, the, the maybe, you know, Charlotte gets promoted to full professor or farther stage, we start to actually have that layer of the technologies mapped. And in the paper, I talk about that saying the Johansson's model is we have some set of technologies and then we figure out what types of collaborations go on it. And I'm trying to do the opposite here of saying, here are all these types of collaborations, and then how, how can we map the different clusters of technologies onto those different types of collaborations? Yeah. Do you think that Johansson model only goes that direction? Because, you know, when I teach it, you know, only in a very surface level, I leave the model blank, you know, and say, you know, how would people interact in this way? What are some examples? Just to right, right. So they're actually kind of going in the other direction. Of the All right. Describing I couldn't hear the first part of what you were saying. I would say when I teach it, I start with the, the, the grid blank. And right. kind of say, okay, look, I've, if I wanted to work with people asynchronously, what are the ways that we might think to do it? Right, right. Yeah, and I think taking that approach leaves more space for that dialogue of it's not just one kind of tool that we might be using different kinds of tools. But the fundamental, you know, issue, uh, well, one of the fundamental issues with the matrix is that it still posits location and synchronicity as this is what we think about when we think about collaboration. Right, the only important thing, yeah. Well, it's also good to have them break the grid, too, just to go. Yeah. Just to see it, like. I'm all about breaking grids, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good example. Go up, like, Charlotte, you know, be around for a few